Today we're buying the worst slab at the lumber yard and turning it into the most beautiful table in the world. Well, at least my mom told me it's beautiful. I am an idiot. Let me explain. Here we're picking out a piece for our first ever epoxy resin slab table. And as you can see, there were plenty of good ones to choose from. But for whatever reason, we felt drawn to this one. So we had some questions that only Big John could answer. Like, do you find that pieces like this do stick around longer? And the reason I had those perfect them? ones in the back, because <laughs> I'm trying to encourage yeah, someone yeah. to use this one. Yeah. In many eyes, 90% of the world's eyes, probably an unusable yeah. piece. Yeah. We used an unusable Using piece. Unusable. That's a good title. Now, I don't know if it's because we're naive or what, but this sounded like a challenge to us, so we took her home. And not to foreshadow too much, but as you're going to see, this one definitely posed some challenges. The first challenge is, like you can see in this shot, instead of being one piece, it's basically three separate pieces. And these braces are holding everything together. So that means as soon as we cut it into a circle, it's going to fall apart. So after determining roughly where we want the top to come from, we're marking out some spots where we can stabilize the slab from the underside. Now, this doesn't have to look fancy, and it's something that you'll never even be able to see unless the piece is flipped upside down. But this being a high-end piece, we at least wanted to do something slightly nice. So we decided to use an off-cut from the slab to make these rectangular pieces with rounded corners. Basically wooden band-aids. And that seemed fitting since, if you think about it, they kind of serve the same purpose as band-aids. So with those installed, I could flip the whole slab back over, and thanks to this little branch nub, it almost went terribly. But thankfully I was able to get it flipped so that we could mark out exactly where we want the top to come from and cut it free. Also, quick little side note, it's always hard to get a sense of scale in these videos, but we were shooting for about a 42 inch diameter, which might not sound like much, but for a coffee table is actually pretty big. For example, an equivalent table from Ikea would be more like 35 inches. And I know seven inches might not sound like a lot, but it is. It's the same reason you should always spend the extra $2 on the large pizza. Okay, and no plans yet, but we were left with this chunk of the slab that's about 26 inches wide and almost six feet long, which we're definitely gonna use for another project. Our first thought is maybe a desk, but if you got any ideas or you like that idea, let me know in the comments and we'll figure it out. This is where we realized that we might be in for more of a challenge than we had bargained for. And that's because the wood in this light area here was really soft and spongy. I'm not sure if it was wood rot or what it was. All we knew is it couldn't stay. So at first we tried to go at it with a really light touch and keep as much of the wood as possible. And we went through a few rounds of removing wood, then testing it, removing, testing, until finally we realized that we we're gonna have to go at it with an ax instead of a scalpel. I mean, technically it's still mostly a chisel, but you get what I mean, a metaphorical ax. And I'm not gonna lie or sugarcoat it. Initially, we were pretty bummed about this because now this epoxy section is gonna have to be way bigger than we wanted it. But at the end of the day, sometimes you just have to roll with the punches. It's like Big John always tells me. What's, what's the definition of creativity? The ability to problem solve. All right, well, Webster's might not agree, but I like it. And honestly, maybe this was a blessing in disguise. You can make that call at the end of the video when you see the finished piece. And if you like it, or if you hate it, let me know. And actually, if you really like it and you wanna buy it, it's gonna be for sale, so give it a look if you're interested. So in this shot, I was using a circular piece of melamine to template route the slab. And the way that I made the piece of melamine was with a circle cutting jig. And by the way, that piece is also gonna be the base of our form in a minute. Anyway, in hindsight, I should have also cut the slab with the jig, as this created a few obstacles. But thankfully, you can usually overcome any obstacle with just a little creativity. The ability to problem solve. Honestly, this was one of those situations where I feel like our woodworking experience kind of hurt us. I mentioned at the top of the video that this is the first ever epoxy resin slab table that we've built. But between the two of us, we do have about 20 years of experience building furniture. And in that time, I would say the main skill we focus on is attempting to do things accurately. But what I realized here is that at this stage of the game, accuracy doesn't really matter. And actually, it might even be a bad thing at this point. 
Now, I know things are looking kind of rough right now. For example, here, it might look like we're just hacking away at the edges. And you're right, we are. But that's only because none of this matters. The circle that we just routed out is still slightly oversized, so you're not going to see any of those edges. And all of these edges are going to get covered in epoxy, so you're not going to see them either. Now, if this piece were going to have exposed live edges, like the dining table that we built in the last video, we would have been way more careful during this step. But since it's not, really the only concern here is creating a surface that's going to get a good bond. At this point in the build, we were ready to build the form and cast the epoxy. And this is the other major obstacle that was caused by building the form and the top the exact same size. So in these shots, we're prepping both the form and the slab. And that entailed wiping on a sealer coat of epoxy, using landscape edging and some screws to build the form, caulking and taping everything, spraying the form with mold release, scuffing up the edges of the slab, and removing any dried epoxy clumps from the surface of the slab, and then setting the slab in the form. And this is where the problem arose. So you've heard me say it a couple times already, but the slab and the form have the exact same radius. That means it should fit right in there. The thing is, to make the form actually work, you need to seal it up, which we did with a bead of caulk running along the inside of the perimeter. So when you go to set the slab into the form, it's going to sit up about an eighth of an inch off the bottom of the form. Thankfully, we're pretty creative and we have the ability to problem solve. And our solution was to route a small chamfer along the underside of the slab, which won't affect the final piece at all. And now we have a nice tight fit. Now, I know I said that I'm new to resin tables, but something that I'm already noticing is that epoxy pours involve a lot of foreplay that all leads up to like three minutes of action. All the cutting, the edge treatment, the form building, everything so far, all of it has been preparing for this moment and hoping that it all goes as smooth as possible. And with this first pour, it did. There were no surprises and nothing dripped or leaked or came out of the form prematurely, so we were happy. All right, I'm going to leave that analogy there. And since this stuff is going to need to set up for a couple of days, let's get to work on the base. So we had a lot of ideas initially when we first started thinking about a base design, but these were the two that we liked the most. The idea with this one was to pay homage to the slab that the top came from, which was this sort of Y-shaped piece. And I thought that this was interesting and a cool idea, but maybe it was just a little too cool for the sake of cool if that makes any sense. So we decided to go with this one instead, which is maybe more generic and doesn't have as much of a story. But at the end of the day, I think it's just a more upscale looking design and I can save this why thing for some other time. In our last video, I had asked all of you for input on the level of detail that we put into our videos. And we got a ton of really good feedback from you guys. So first off, thank you for that. And the overwhelming majority of you said that you liked the option of seeing the builds in detail and thought that it was a good idea to either one, show it in full detail, and if it gets to be too long, you can just skip ahead in the video to the parts that you do want to see, or two, link to a video that does go into detail about any parts that we need to gloss over in any given video. So here I'm going to try that second approach. Basically, we're going to show every step of what we did to build the base here so that if you're just casually interested, you should get a pretty good idea of what it entails. But I'm not going to talk about all of it in detail for every step, because honestly, it would take me like 20 minutes just to do that. In other words, I could make an entire video just about this portion of the build. So that's what I did. Well, not exactly, but kind of. In the description, I'm going to link to a video that I did a few months back for a round eating table or breakfast table that we had named Surly. Now, I know that the two bases look a little different, but their workflows are pretty much exactly the same. So if you're confused by anything you see me doing here, there's a pretty good chance that I explained it in that video. So definitely go check that one out if you like this kind of detail. And if you do and you're still confused about anything, leave a comment here or maybe better yet, leave a comment on that one, 
and I'll try my best to answer any questions. So even though in this portion of the build, we're not talking about everything that we're doing, we did film a ton, actually kind of a crazy amount. Yet somehow it seems like without fail, no matter how much I film, I always miss at least one shot. And in this instance, it was kind of a crucial one. Thankfully, I realized this in the moment and I was able to do a quick dramatic reenactment. <laughs> So the reason that I cut this in half is because my idea was to join the pieces like you see in this animation, with one full leg assembly and two half leg assemblies. And then that gets us to the point where I'm doing what is probably the most confusing part of the base build, which is what you're seeing in these shots. Basically, I needed to cut my top stretchers to their final width so that I can cut in my hardware. And if it weren't for that, I would wait to do this step. But the way that the hardware is going to work is that it's going to be an oversized hole with a washer and a bolt. And this is going to give plenty of wiggle room for the top to be able to expand and contract through the seasons without busting anything apart. So the reason that this is confusing is because the order of operations is just a little complex. This joinery has to be cut now because I won't physically be able to fit the tools to the workpiece after I've glued everything together. And honestly, understanding and taking advantage of order of operations at least to me, is the single biggest differentiator between somebody who builds okay stuff and somebody who builds great stuff. What I mean is you can have the best eye-hand coordination and the best tools, but if your approach is wrong, your work suffers. And I totally understand that to 95% of people watching this, this might not matter. And that's fine. If you're watching this strictly for entertainment purposes, I thank you for clicking on this video out of the thousands of others that you could have clicked on. But for the next 10 seconds, I want to talk to the other 5% of you. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to shut up for a second because this part's too cool to talk over. Okay, to the other 5% of you who are either into or getting into woodworking and truly want to reach that next level, I highly, highly encourage you to check out our woodworking courses and plans. I don't want to hard sell you and... I am a humble person, but I think that our plans are the best out there. So I'm going to leave it at that and I'll put a link in the description. And if you're interested, you can go check it out, preview some chapters, and I'll let you decide if it's right for you. Okay, so at this point, the epoxy has been curing for about 24 hours and you can see that it's in a sort of, I don't know, Abba Zabba consistency phase. But anyway, it's firm enough that we can pour the rest. And speaking of that, the epoxy that we're using is called Fathom Deep Set from Total Boat. So technically, with this slab being only two inches thick, we could have done this entire pour in one shot, but we didn't, obviously. And it's hard for me to calculate exactly how much epoxy we used on this table because we were simultaneously pouring for another project. But I do know that between the two, we used about six gallons and had some left over. Okay, now if I had to pick one shot, or I guess a series of shots that I think were cooler than the bolt and washer flying through the air in slow motion. It's got to be these epoxy bubbles popping in slow motion shots. So, yeah. I dig it. All right, I think I'm going to do a sort of late stage audible. And that is a few minutes ago, you guys would have seen in the video me cutting one of these legs in half. So while I was in the office, I was just kind of drawing out some ideas for fun. And I tried a three-legged version of this base and I just liked it better. There's some beeping, hang on. I wonder how many people those beeps have saved the lives of. Anyway, it's done. So I drew up the three-legged version. I liked that. There's the beeping again. You know, I'm just gonna talk over the beeping. It. Um, so once I cut it in half, there's a few different ways I can go to make the base. Essentially, I can cut a 120 degree angle on the tips. That way, all three legs are equal spaced. And another idea I have is to take an off cut from the slab that we're using and make a couple of bridge kind of connector pieces. So I'm not sure exactly what that's gonna look like. So. I'm gonna go drop some stuff. I'll put that over me talking right here so you guys can see what's in my head right now. And once I do that and decide which one I like better, I think I'm gonna go with that route. Um, okay, we got through the beeping, so 
I'm gonna go give it a shot and I'll see you on the other side. All right, as you can see here, I'm cutting my one remaining intact assembly in half, which means that I'm pretty much committed to doing some version of the three-legged base at this point. And since I now have four legs for a three-legged table, I decided to try making at least one of the version that has the angled tips. And this seemed like a totally reasonable and viable option. But that said, I decided to go with the bridge connector. And I could lie and say that I went this way because, I don't know, as an artist and a designer, it ties the base and the slab together. I mean, I guess that's not a lie. It's true. But more truthfully, I did it because I've never done anything like this before and it just sounded like more fun. Or at least more different, which sometimes can mean more fun. I don't know. What I do know is that a question that we get a lot, and you might have asked yourself earlier in the video, or who knows, maybe you already typed it into the comments, is why do you use templates instead of just shaping the actual workpiece? And honestly, there's lots of reasons. And I won't get into all of them here, but if I had to pick just one, I would do it by asking a question back to you, or asking you to imagine a situation. Actually, you don't even need to imagine. Go grab a piece of quarter inch MDF, and also grab a thick chunk of some kind of hardwood. Now draw a random shape with some organic curves on the two pieces and use whatever tool you want, jigsaws, bandsaws, sanders, anything, and try to shape the two pieces to exactly hit the line that you drew. Okay, now imagine that you need to make three or four identical copies of that exact shape. That's one of the reasons I use templates. Okay, now I wanna make you a deal. I wanna give you $480 in exchange for your subscription. Here's what I mean. So another question we're frequently asked is, should I get the big domino or the little one? Those aren't the technical names. And for woodworking, the answer 99.9% .9 of the time is the little one. I can literally count the number of times on one hand that I wished I had the bigger one instead of the smaller one. Actually, I can do it on zero hands. But on the flip side of that coin, when I am dominoing something, there are lots of situations where the bigger one would be at best cumbersome and at worst unusable. And I'm not saying that if you already have the big one, you made a mistake. Actually, I think there's even an adapter for the big one that lets you cut the smaller dominoes. So you can easily make the case that it's more versatile and useful. It's just, that's my honest answer whenever anybody asks me. So there you go. I just saved you 480 bucks, unless you weren't gonna buy a domino and now you want one, in which case I just cost you like a thousand bucks. But anyway, if you feel like you got some value there or if you're just enjoying this video and you wanna see more like it, hit the subscribe button. Unlike a domino, big or small, it doesn't cost you anything. And in all sincerity, I do appreciate it. All right, here comes the most satisfying part of this entire build, immediately followed by the least satisfying part of this entire build. So most satisfying was removing the landscape edging. It peeled off perfectly. I mean, that's a legitimate smile on my face right there. And this is a genuine reaction from Sean. Ooh, that's reusable. Yeah, this is totally reusable. Unfortunately, that was followed up by realizing that the melamine base was completely stuck to the slab and there was no way to cleanly peel it off, which meant that we had to spend a few hours using a power planer to essentially pulverize the entire sheet of melamine. So my takeaway here is next time we're going to quadruple the amount of mold release spray that we use and maybe even line the bottom with more tuck tape because neither of us wants to do this again. But with that done, Next, we decided to try using our CNC to flatten the slab. So in our last video, we took the slabs to a wide belt sander for this step. But this slab is considerably smaller, and we just wanted to give it a try. So here's the breakdown. Well, first, obviously, you have to have a CNC, and CNCs aren't cheap. In terms of time, though, we needed to remove a total of 9 sixteenths of an inch of thickness, and each pass removed 1 sixteenth, so 9 passes. And each pass took about 45 minutes. So that's about six hours and 45 minutes of the CNC running. Meanwhile, round trip to go get something like this surfaced for me is about two and a half hours door to door and would probably cost about 50 to 75 bucks. Now, obviously there's way more that goes into this. And really I'm not trying to come to any kind of answer with this. It's just, I don't know, food for thought. Okay, here's a woodworking tip. 
If you ever need to find the center of a circle, you can do what I'm doing here. Draw two random chords across your circle. Just make sure that they aren't parallel to one another. Then draw a perpendicular bisector line through each of those chords, and wherever the two meet is the center of your circle. Actually, that might have been a geometry tip. Anyway, having that marked, now Sean could use the circle cutting jig to cut the top to its final dimension, which was, as you'll recall, 42 inches. Will you recall that? I don't know how much attention you're paying. I might be on mute right now. All right, so things are starting to take shape and now we can put some edge details on both the top and the base. On the top, we're gonna do a large chamfer on the underside and a small round over on the top edge. And on the base, we're gonna do what we always call a thumbnail profile where you get a curved edge with a crisp line. And while we're doing that, I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So I've been using Squarespace for about five years now and prior to that, I used to code everything on my own. And that's fine if you like doing that, but for me, I eventually realized that there was no way I could handle all of the technical needs of my growing business. And I was spending a lot more time on my website than I should have been. So switching over to Squarespace made it super easy to build and maintain my site, buy domains and all that stuff. But probably the main thing that I've come to appreciate is that they have a lot of e-commerce tools, which have been really helpful since we started selling plans. Things like inventory management, a simple and secure checkout process, and unlimited products allow us to easily manage our online transactions. So if you're thinking about starting a website, or honestly, even if you already have one that you think could be better, you owe it to yourself to at least check out Squarespace and see if it might be a better option for you. You can just head over to squarespace.com slash four eyes for a free trial. Then when you're ready to launch, use the offer code four eyes to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, thanks Squarespace. Now, if you're bummed that I didn't talk about these edge details in, well, detail, I'm gonna link to a video in the description that goes over both of these and more in, well, again, detail. All right, now we can finally put the base and the top together for the first time to see what it all looks like. But before we attach anything, we need to center the base and figure out what orientation we want. And here we ran into a little problem. This one is definitely going to go into epoxy. Maybe I'll test it out to make sure it holds. So what you're seeing in this shot is probably the most critical test. Because really the only force that these bolts are ever going to be subject to is if somebody were to lift the table by the top and the weight of the base was hanging from the bolts. And I can guarantee you that the force that I'm pulling up with here is way more than the weight of the base, and honestly way more than the weight of the top if somebody were to lift it upside down from the base. That said, I'd come this far, so I decided to break it with a hammer. And this was probably a bad test because the threaded insert is way too close to the edge of the piece, so it wasn't that hard to bust through. I mean, I still had to hit it with a hammer a couple times, but you get what I mean and still way overkill for what is needed. But next I decided to install a threaded insert into a puck of epoxy that had cured in one of our cups. And this is much more accurate to what will actually be on the underside of the table. And after watching this, you can see why I'm not at all concerned about this attachment. The entire bolt bent and the threaded insert stayed in, so this thing's strong. And with confidence high and back of the table, we could mark our threaded insert locations, but I'm not going to actually install them until we've put finish on the piece. Speaking of that, with the base, it was just a matter of easing all of the transitions. And then for finish, we sprayed on a few coats of water-based polyurethane. And the reason for that is since the base is maple, this will keep it as light in color as possible. For sanding and finishing the top, it was a lot more work. And sitting here editing this right now, I have to say that sanding and finishing used to be a part of my videos that I always thought was kind of the most boring visually for you, the viewer. But with slabs, I think it's actually one of the more visually satisfying parts because it's the moment when you get to really see all of the hard work pay off. It's kind of a woodworking cliche to say my favorite part is putting finish on and seeing the grain pop. A lot of people say it, but I always very much disagreed with that. But with these projects, while it's still not my favorite part, I guess I get it a little more. Real quick, I wanna thank the following people for the support that they've given me. I say it in every video, so I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm gonna keep sounding like a broken record because I truly am grateful. So thank you for everything. And if you enjoy these videos too, 
and want to support the show, snag a Four Eyes t-shirt, a Field Notes booklet, and even get discounts on our plans. I'll throw a link in the description so you can check it out, see if it's right for you. And as always, no pressure. I started off this video half jokingly by saying that we bought the worst slab at the yard and turned it into the most beautiful table in the world. The most beautiful table in the world half was the joke, but the part about the worst slab was true. So after deciding to do that, I guess the ultimate question is, am I happy that I went that route? And I think the answer is, yes, I am happy. Sure, I wish that the wider epoxy section had been narrower, but to some people, that might be the best part of the table. It's subjective. But objectively, now I know that even a slab that other people might have passed up is 100% usable. So back to that opening line once more. The, the most beautiful table in the world line. Is it? We'll never know. It's like trying to declare that pepperoni is a better pizza topping than sausage. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. All we know for certain is, always buy the large. See you in the next one.